Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future in Review podcast, where we talk with leaders in tech, investment, and business about the future of technology and the global economy. I'm your host, Barrett Anderson, the COO of Future in Review, which The Economist has called the best technology conference in the world. And I'm here today with Marlon Nichols, who is the founding managing partner at Mac Venture Capital. Marlon, welcome. It's great to have you here. No, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, So I'm curious to hear a little bit more about, I should mention, Marlon is going to be a speaker at Future in Review this year, November 6th through 9th. Um, at the Terranea Resort in LA. Um, We are so excited to have him on site talking about venture capital in general and kind of like the future of venture investing. Um, And so I'm curious to hear, Marlon, just from you a little bit more about your background. So you started out working for for Intel, as I understand, running one of their portfolios. Is that correct? No. uh, So actually, my professional... Is the internet lying to me? (laughs) <laughs> I was at, I was an investment director at Intel, so I was oh. um, yeah I was, I was basically a VC at, at Intel um, Capital. Um, and yeah, yeah. So I'm curious, like what from there you moved to found cross culture ventures. Mm-hmm. What was what was that transition like? Like what was the inspiration for you? What what motivated you to go from Intel to founding your own firm? It's a big yeah. Week. So Intel was my first like real stop in, in venture. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, when I, jo- I joined right out of business school, I, I, um, I was actually the CEO of Cornell's pre-seed fund for a year and a half of the two that I was, that I was there for business school. Um, graduated and joined Intel Capital, which was at the time the, one of the largest and most active venture firms in the world, um, deploying anywhere from 200 to 500 million per year, primarily in Series A, Series B companies. And so, you know, when I got there, I was just happy to be there. I'm like, I got a job in venture. This is great. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and my business card, you know, was a meaningful one, right? Like um, entrepreneurs wanted to speak with me, right? <laughs> because I was, I was at Intel Capital, you know, um, over the, I was there for five, five and a half years in total. And um, during that time, I you know, managed to build a reputation that was my own, you know, separate and, and apart from Intel Capital. And so as a result of that, um, entrepreneurs were reaching out to work specifically with me. And um, I was, and Intel is a corporate VC. So the investments that we make have to some way, um, you know, tie back to the corporate strategy. Right. And so um, the problem that was being presented to me was I was meeting some phenomenal founders building what I thought were incredible um, investment opportunities but wasn't able to, to invest in them or with them because it, it was outside of the mandate. Right. Um, and, you know, as the years went on, that, that became uh, more and more prevalent and more and more frustrating. And so that was the, um, the, the impetus for um, thinking about leaving and, and starting my own, my own fund. Um, the other thing was I, I thought I could um, do venture in a better way um, than, than it was being done in terms of um, representation. Um, you know, there's a, it's been, you know, um, documented well that, you know, black, Latinx or Hispanic and, and women founders get far less capital uh, venture dollars than, um, than their white um, male counterparts. And, uh, and I thought that, you know, by through building my own um, vehicle, not only could I invest in, you know, uh, these interesting founders that I was meeting in, in these sectors that were outside of that were out of scope, I could also kind of lead by example, um, invest um, in an equitable way and um, show that having a diverse portfolio, like a truly diverse portfolio, not just black, not just Hispanic, um, not just women, um, also white, also male, that um, <clears throat> we could show, you know, um, a high level of return while demonstrating that you can you can do this um, while um, truly investing in a in a, mer- a meritocratic way, and so that was the um, the rationale for leaving and um, in starting cross culture. So tell me more a little bit about when you said you thought that by investing in an equitable way, how mm-hmm. do you like it's it's there i feel like there's so much talk about that in general right and Mm -hmm. and a lot of it is just window dressing how do you 
it strikes me that you seem to be in a unique position and that you are actually really trying to put that into place seriously. It's not a PR move. It's not, you know, and I don't know that many venture capital firms that can claim, can claim that, which is, a, which is a very good thing. But how do you put that, like, what are the dynamics of actually making that happen? How do you think the, about I mean, it, it comes down to, um, and it's easy, easier for me, right? As a, as a black man, it's hard for me to look at another black person and think that, oh, they won't be capable of, of building, you know, something incredible because essentially if I looked in the mirror, that's what I would be saying to myself. Right. Right. Um, so, so it, it starts there, like just with the belief that, um, irrespective of your um, skin color, race, um, nationality, um, you know, the, the class that you grew up in, um, you can be capable. And so um, my job is to find these exceptionally capable people that are building tremendous um, companies and fund them, irrespective of, of those things, right? And I also want to be investing in things that that I care about, that I'm really interested in, right? And so if I'm interested in the space and I meet, um, you know, um, founders that are building in that space, it shouldn't matter to me um, whether they're male, female, black, white, Asian, Native American, right? What should matter is that I'm picking the team that has the, the, the best chance of winning this category, right? And, and that usually comes down to, product, market, and founder fit. One of the things that I have personally noticed, I won't make you say this as an opinion, but one of the things that I have noticed as a woman in business who has done some fundraising for my own company um, is that a lot of kind of Silicon Valley VC money tends to go into these like races essentially like this happened with uber and lyft right or the scooter companies where they one of them picks a winner and then there's this pile on of money into or food delivery apps right mm -hmm. pile on of money into these services that are useful to some people who but it's primarily people who are like vcs already right like they live in urban areas they've got you know a lot of net worth that they can spend on these things or a significant amount of net worth that they can spend on these things. Um, and I'm curious if you like, when you think about Mac and the investments that you make, do you take that into consideration? It would seem from some of what you've invested in that you have a little bit broader of a perspective about what is useful and what is needed in the future that we are building together. And I'm curious mm -hmm. if do you, that's my perspective. So does that resonate with you? Yeah. Like, um, does... Yeah. I mean, um, at our, at our core, or, um, our ethos is, um, one, um, the investments that we make, uh, should, um, you know, make things better, not worse. Right. And then two, um, they should target the 99% versus the 1%. Right. And that just, that just um, logically makes sense to us, right? They're 99 is greater than one, right? And so if, um, you know, if, if you're building a company uh, or a solution, you want that solution to be applicable to, to more, to more people than, you know, than less people, right? Because then uh, the market opportunity is just larger, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we think about it like that, um, you know, companies like, like like Uber though, um, I don't I don't think that as a company that was built for one percent, right? Like, no, I actually with, Uber I don't think was built for the one percent. That's yeah. perhaps a bad example because it because it it everyone uses it, right? It's it's actually right. very very useful for a wide range of people. Yeah, it was improving on a um, you know on something that already exists, right? Taxis, right? Um, but I think probably unintentionally um, it was also solving challenges for you know folks in diverse communities um, or from diverse communities uh, like they we always we used to joke a lot about um, you know being a black man trying to hail a yellow taxi um, right. in Manhattan right <laughs> at night um, kind of a, a difficult um, didn't come adventure, right <laughs> uh, yeah and so you know I, I think we were unintentionally 
um, solve for for challenges like that, right? And I think that's the you know as an investor, um, I think that highlights a, a key benefit of having uh, a diverse team, right? Because you know, um, so our team we have um, we have an Asian woman, we have a, um, a black woman, we have a, um, a multiracial uh, man, we have a, a white man, we have black men. Um, you know, uh, and when we're talking about opportunities, right? Uh, and, and each of those people come from different uh, types of backgrounds to different classes, different um, parts of the country, world. Um, those perspectives come, come into, into, um, into view, right? And so now we're making decisions with a lot more information, right? And so, you know, if we were, Uber was um, out well before we, we created our fund, but if we were looking at it, you know, that's one of the things that we would have spotted like right away. It would have just made sense to us, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas if, if that's not your, your experience or it's not the experience of people in your network, there's no way that you could think about that as a, um, you know, as an, as an experience that you're trying to solve for. So it just an, an, another, um, you know, reason why, you know, having a truly diverse, um, um, you know, fund managers and um, fund allocators is important. Can you tell me about a couple of things, you know, any companies that you have in your portfolio now that you feel like fit that category? Which category? Well, so things that you would, that maybe like a, a white VC might not have been as excited about or as interested in that you were like, oh, we really see this opportunity. Um, man, they, I'll say there are a few that, um, you know, now they make a lot of sense. Um, but, uh, you know, when, when they first started, maybe didn't make um, a ton of sense. So, um, a more recent one is a company called Spill. Um, and Spill is a, a, a new social network, essentially, um, founded by two former executives um, at, that were at, at Twitter and um, saw the way that, you know, how Twitter was built and the direction that it was going in after, um, you know, uh, Elon took, um, took the helm and um, decided that they, they needed to build something different. Um, and some of the things that they were solving for was um, was one making sure that it's um, you know people of color um, or under just underrepresented folks in general on the platform because that includes queer right um, are protected right and um, and but still have a have a and have a voice on the platform right so so how do you make sure you you're building from the ground up you know things to um, uh, to, uh, I guess, focus on trust and safety, right? Um, then another thing that I think maybe um, non-diverse uh, fund managers won't be thinking about is who, um, what part of the population drives uh, a lot of the interesting things that we see on social media? <laughs> yeah. Primarily black women and, and queer people. Um, they're the, they're the um, initial authors. Of, of these of these things, um, but they don't always get um, properly compensated for it, right? Because they're iterations of right, the right. thing that they that they created, um, and so you know what Spill is uh, is doing is using the blockchain to make sure that you can um, uh, give um, credit where it's where it's deserved and also compensate based on um you know your, your initial um creation of art right so interesting so is this to, for the create for cre the creator economy in general it's yeah it's good for the creator economy right but it's also a social platform right so you have you know all of us are consumers of it mm -hmm. too right um but making sure that you um you're building for the marginalized ensures that you're building for everyone That's awesome. I was actually just talking to Taylor um, Lorenz about this last week on our podcast. Uh, she has just written this whole book about the creator economy. She'll be at, at the conference as well as a moderator. And she's, you know, all of her work is focused on 
all of a lot of women in the creator economy who have been uncompensated or uncredited for the work that they've done to kind of like in, innovate and create new tools. So yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a definitely a common thread. Yeah. It's something, you know, a, a significant uh, portion of the population cares about, Yeah, right? but, you know, as an investor, you, you may not be thinking about that, right? You, um, you're just thinking, uh, you know, can this be another, uh, TikTok or Instagram or, or whatever. Right. Um, but what is it about, you know, um, who are the drivers of those platforms? Right. And what are they getting or not getting from those platforms? And can it, can it be improved? I love that. Um, so I'm curious, you know, your Mac, the description of Mac in general is, building the world the future the world wants mm -hmm. investing in the world in the, Inve um, in the future the world wants to see exactly yeah. yeah what is the future the world wants that's a that's a big can you tell me a little bit more about that <laughs> that's, a, uh, <laughs> that's a big it's, claim it's, it's a yeah but like how know, do you think it, about that yeah it's actually um you know looking at the world from many different perspectives right and wanting to improve things in a meaningful way um, that um, and, and in particular things that affect people's lives in a meaningful way right so like you know I, I think earlier in this conversation I said one of the things we want to make sure that we do is that we're always investing in things that make the world better as opposed to making it making it worse. Mm -hmm. So that's that's essentially what we're doing, and, and we're you know we do a bunch of research to understand um, emerging behavioral trends and um, you know and big shifts in um, in culture, right? Um, and from that, and you know, make a determination of like what of these things are are going to stick around for a while. And if so, then what are the types of companies that um, that, that are going to be needed, right? It's kind of it's kind of like having a crystal ball, right? If, I, if you had a crystal ball and you could figure out, you know, what people were, where people are spending their time or how people are spending their time and what they're spending their money on. And you could, um, you know, create the companies that fit with that today. Like essentially you're creating tomorrow's next great companies, right? Right. And so that's what we're setting out to do is just understanding um, or determining the uh, identifying, I should say, the emerging behavioral trends um, that have the, the possibility of becoming, um, you know, uh, sustained behaviors, which then become norms, which then become a part of popular culture. Yeah, that's so. Where do you? What trends are you watching now? I mean, there are there are a lot, right? So um, we just talked about the the things in and around um, creators, right? right. And, and the creator safety, economy, trust and safety, and mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's one. Um, you know, in terms of like uh, a place that I'm spending a lot of time on right now are, are um, marketplaces, um, marketplaces that. Um, bring financial institutions and businesses together um, by doing some form of unique underwriting, right? And so as, as an example, um, we invested in a company called Shekel Mobility out of um, Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And um, what they're sitting between um, lending institutions and used car dealerships. Okay. Right? And so it's like a weird place to be, right? But <laughs> um, if you if you know Nigeria, but, but interesting, yeah. Yeah, if you know Nigeria, most cars that are sold are used cars, right? Like by far, like most of cars. the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. A, a um, lot. I should say a lot yeah. of a lot. You yeah. know, yeah. And um and you know uh the problem is the used car dealerships they don't have um, access to significant amounts of capital. So while they have the demand, um, you know, where if they, they bought 10 cars, they could probably sell all 10 of those cars. Mm -hmm. They could probably only um, get enough capital to buy two of those cars and then sell them, right? And so uh, what, what that's contributing to, one, 
is these small businesses aren't able to aren't able to truly grow. Um, and then two, you're not filling a demand um, for yeah. the people, right? So uh, more people should be in cars that that um, but they aren't, right? And so what what Shekel does is it um, it has a unique underwriting process and it works with the bank. Um, and then, uh, so the bank, um, uh, provides a line of credit to Shekel and then Shekel, um, provides the, that, you know, that credit over to, over to the dealers and mm -hmm. then they can, um, and buy bigger fleets and move more vehicles. And it's all collateralized, um, by, by the vehicles, right? But the bank. So they're essentially grow. acting as a, again, kind of like a trust and safety mechanism between dealers who wouldn't necessarily be able to access that capital and yeah. the banks themselves. That's, that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's a, that's a theme. Um, I've been playing with uh, quite a bit uh, recently and we've done a few companies that are doing similar things uh, to that in different um, sectors. Okay. So we've got creator economy, marketplaces. What, what else, what, are, what other patterns are you seeing that's or like trends? Fintechs. Um, as well, um, and I'd say exchanges as well, which, it, which is kind of a derivative of, of, of marketplaces. Um, mm -hmm. Sticking with the, the automotive theme, um, uh, we invested in a, in a company called Exponential Exchange, which is um, tackling uh, automotive insurance for fleet managers, right? So um, a lot of folks don't know this, but if you own a fleet and you want to um, insure that fleet, of, of um, automobiles, you have to um, hold about 50% of the value of that fleet on your books, hmm. right? Which is like, which is huge if you're, if you're right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And think about how, you know, that could go to, towards working capital or whatever, or to, mm -hmm. you know, grow the fleet even more. And so um, the other thing is that there are uh, kind of futures um, exchanges or markets for a lot of commodities, right? Tomatoes, <laughs> right? They can, right? Right. There are hedges for that stuff. And so what they created is um, essentially that, a futures market for um, fleet owners, working with um, the insurance companies, uh, you know, a trading platform, uh, and then, um, you know, the, the, the hedge funds or, or traders, et cetera, right? So now that 50% can go down to like as little as 5%. Wow. That's awesome. Okay, here's one thing. I, I don't know if you're, you're working on this at all or are familiar with any companies that are doing this, but I've always thought, you know, futures trading is one of those things where if you understand or can anticipate what's going to happen, you could make some significant money as an individual doing that. But the current ecosystem in the current marketplace isn't set up for the average individual to be able to access it, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's basically you're, you're kind of fenced out unless you have a significant amount of capital. Mm -hmm. It's not built for a commercial investor or, a, I mean, a, like a, you know, consumer Retail investor. Right. Yeah. It, um, yeah, it, that's true. And that this company, like their customers are not you and you, you and me, right? Um, their, their customers are, you know, large banks, et, mm -hmm. et cetera. Right, insurance companies, um, and and the fleet managers, the fleet owners, right. Um, but it's adding, it's creating real value, right, to to those organizations, which means it can create real value for the company and ultimately real value for its investors. Yeah, yeah. I I I think what I'm trying to say is I would love to see that model applied to. Oh, climate, okay. climate risk in a way, you know, especially with like food futures and water futures. Like at mm -hmm. the moment, the only institutions that can, for the most part, access those are the either folks with a lot of money or capital or resources or knowledge or some kind of. And so I'm, it would be very interesting to see if you could kind of set up a, I'm just, I'm just spitballing now. So to see yeah. if you could set up if you could set up some kind of fund that, that would allow those who are most affected by climate change to invest in futures and then have additional capital to reinvest into their communities or you know I, I this is a, this, these are the kinds idea. of things that I, I think about <laughs> yeah I haven't seen that company yet but I, it sounds like it's a terrific idea <laughs> if you find it please let me know we'll do we'll do <laughs> um well okay so Marlon I have I have just you know, a couple more questions for you. One, 
Um, I'm curious, you know, as someone who started your own fund, I always feel like I learn a lot from my mistakes. I don't know if you agree with that, but you should. Can you tell me, can you tell me like, what was the mistake that you, you made as a VC that you learned the most from? Wow. Um, which one? <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, um, I think early in my career, I fell, you know, victim to the, um, kind of the follow, like what you described earlier, right? Everyone just piling on into, um, into this thing because someone that you respect or that the market um, respects said yes, right? Mm -hmm. And um, didn't do as much, you know, diligence as I as I should have, and ended up with a, a really poor investment. Um, so, you know, what I learned from that was like we always do our own work, right? It's like we we definitely take cues from people that we, re we respect or groups that we respect, but um, we're always going to to do go through our process on top of that to make sure that, um, you know, we've properly vetted it because the, the thing about what makes investors who they are is the lens at which they, they look at these opportunities through. And my lens is going to be different than, you know, investor X's lens. Right. And I want to make sure that we're able to catch the things that, that matter to us. Um, and evaluate the things that, that matter to us in the way that we need to. And so you know, um, making sure that we are diligent in the, in the review of um, opportunities in front of us is something that we don't, um, we don't take lightly and, and we don't cut corners on. Diligence and due diligence. Yep. <laughs> um, so if I'm, I'm curious how you all think about leading, right? As an entrepreneur and as someone who has worked with a lot of entrepreneurs, one of the biggest challenges, especially for underprivileged founders, women and people of color, is like finding someone to lead you around, right? Like I've talked to so many investors who are like, well, we'll, we'll we would love to invest, come back when you have a lead. And I'm given kind of the focus and, and intent of Mac, I'm just curious how you think about signaling to other investors or um, being a leader in that way. like. How do you think about, how do you all think about that? Yeah, we, we lead the vast majority of deals that we, that we do, right? Um, we don't need, um, I don't know, approval or acceptance or, you know, um, an okay from, from any other, um, you know, firm, right? We're doing the work ourselves to, um, to find conviction um, for the investments that we ultimately make and conviction in the founders that we ultimately invest in. Um, and if we have that, then we're going to, we're going to move forward, um, you know, and we'll bring folks along with us. Right. Um, we have, you know, different firms that we, you know, we appreciate and respect as co-travelers, um, cause they, they can add, you know, um, something different to the companies that, that we're investing in together. And so we'll, you know, so we're happy to, to lead, um, and, you know, um, you know, be decisive. And, um, you know, and write that first check. And are there, when you think about, you know, what, what Mac brings versus what other firms bring, what, what do you, do you think is your kind of key value mm -hmm. prop for yeah, entrepreneurs so, who might want to work with you? Yeah. So if you, if you, um, if you were to meet, uh, you know, our, our team, like the founders, right. One was, you know, one of the, um, I guess best ever, um, uh, kind of account executives or, um, talent managers in, in Hollywood. One was a former, um, former mayor of Washington, DC. Um, you know, I was a, a consultant at one point. Um, you know, another was also a, um, um, an agent. And so the, the thing that all of those professions have in common is you have to, you have to be good at storytelling. You have to be good at crafting a succinct message that's um, targeted at a specific group and that have that message resonate, right? And so um, go-to-market strategy is, about, is all about um, storytelling. Yeah. And the way that you tell your story as an early stage company has an outsized um, impact 
on how quickly it can grow and sometimes on how large it ultimately can grow too. And so that's one of our secret sauces, right? It's um, being able to, um, to help with go-to-market strategy and storytelling. Um, I think the other, the other thing is, and other investors will say this too, um, is that um, the quality of our network, right? Coming from the different backgrounds that we've come from um, and kind of growing up in, in those different industries, now, you know, the folks that started with us as, as peers are our captains of those um, industries. And mm-hmm. so, you know, oftentimes we can pick up the phone or send an email, which results in, you know, a, a very senior level meeting um, that can result in um, a unique partnership um, or in some cases, even an acquisition. Um, so our, our, our network is, I, you know, I'd say second to none. Um, and then the other, the third thing is that we're, we've all been operators at, at some point. Like my first job out of undergrad was with a seed stage, um, uh, software company that we grew into the UK and Europe before, um, before it was acquired. Right. Um, we've all built something, right. Um, uh, one of my partners, um, is currently building, um, probably one of the most important media companies of our, of our generation. Um, he scaled that up pretty significantly. So being able to work with entrepreneurs um, and share perspective, um, you know, from the same seat that they're currently sitting in mm-hmm. is tremendously important and valuable. And so I'd say those are the, the three areas where we, you know, um, excel. Awesome. Well, Marlon, I cannot wait to spend more time with you in LA in November. Um, If you are watching this and you want to, like me, spend more time with Marlon, you can buy a ticket to Future in Review. Um, And um, we hope to see you all there. But I'm very much looking forward to the conversation that will take place on stage there. Um, We've got a killer lineup um adding more folks all the time and like mac we are very much focused on you know we are a tech conference but we're focused on how do we use technology to change the world for the better um so that is very much a part of our ethos and i look forward to many more conversations about these things at future interview thank you so much for joining me marlon it was great to talk to you it was a pleasure thanks for having me